Today's topic is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yogi Berra, he is one of my all-time favorite philosophers and just so happens to be a baseball player. Um, he played almost his entire career of baseball with the New York Yankees. And I'm certainly no Yankee fan. I mean, you know, Yankees are American League, and we all know American League's not really, American League's not really baseball, right? I mean, with a designated hitter and, you know. <laughs> we, won't, we, won't go into, we won't go into that, but we all know, right? So regardless of who you root for, everyone, I think, would agree. Yogi Berra was one of the more colorful uh, people, and he added more personality to the sport of baseball than just about anybody ever before or since. Uh, he was a catcher. He was an outfielder. Uh, he was a manager. He played almost 19 years, from 1946 to 1965, for the New York Mets. Or, excuse me, Yankees. See, there I go, back over to the National League. Can't help myself. New York Yankees. But regardless, um, Yogi Berra was one of only four players to be named most valuable player in the American League three times, and one of only six managers to lead both American and National League teams to the World Series. Yogi had, shall we say, a very unique way of observing the world around him. And he was most famous for his artful use of what are more commonly known as dogberries. The uncanny ability to butcher statements, comments, and observations in such a way that on the surface it seemed to make sense, but when you begin to think about it a little bit, it didn't make any sense at all. You might remember one of his more famous phrases, it's like deja vu all over again. That's Yogi Berra. <laughs> a fork in a road is a popular metaphor used in literature and storytelling to describe those defining moments in life when a major decision or choice has to be made. Yogi's butchering of this common metaphor brings us to someone in the Bible whom God had brought to their own fork in the road. His name was Abraham. The Bible tells us Abraham, born Abram, and later renamed by God Abraham, was the forefather of the and the patriarch of the Jewish people. He was a descendant of Shem, born in the city of Ur of the Chaldeans, beyond the great river Euphrates. Now, to avoid confusion when I'm talking about Abram, not reading scripture, but talking about him, I'm just going to say Abraham, okay, because... We, you know, otherwise, I'll just bounce back and forth between Abram and Abraham. Um, but we're talking about the same person, Abram or Abraham. Um, according to Joshua 24, verse 2, Abraham's ancestors were idolaters. They were polytheists. In other words, they believed in many gods. Archaeology has shown us that the area where Abraham was from was the center of moon worship. In fact, many of the names associated with Abraham's family in the Bible are derived from the name of their moon god. I tell you this so that you understand where Abraham was coming from when the true Lord God of the universe spoke to Abraham for the very first time, and he presented him with his first fork in the road. We read in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." Abraham was about to embark on a divine path with huge implications for not only himself and his family, but for all of humanity and for all time. It would be through Abraham the nation of Israel would be born and the law given. It was through Abraham the Messiah Jesus, the Savior of the world, would walk among us. But it began with Abraham being brought to a fork in the road. 
and making a choice. God said, go. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, the choice Abraham made by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that, was, that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. As Abraham was traveling through the land of Canaan, the Bible tells us in Genesis 12, 7, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. This morning we're going to be taking a look at Genesis chapter 15. So if you'll join me and open your Bibles, we'll begin with the first verse in Genesis chapter 15. And Genesis 15, 1 says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham chose well when he was first called by the Lord in Genesis chapter 12. But no doubt after these things, he was a little confused and unsure about where things were going. I mean, Abraham hadn't learned, uh, hadn't quite learned what God's capabilities really were yet. It was thought by people of the time that power and influence of God's were limited to their geographical area. God had promised to make a great nation of Abraham, but Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. Sarah, his wife, was 65 years old. Obviously, this was weighing heavily on Abraham's mind. Knowing this, God spoke these words to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. God is telling Abraham two very important things here. First, God promises to protect Abraham. I am your shield. Second, Abraham will be greatly rewarded. If we could only remember when we have the Lord, we have the best possible defense. Not only do we have the protection we need, we also have the provision we need. God wants to be everything we need. He wants to be our protector. He wants to be our provider. Verses 2 and 3 says, But Abram, Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house, Eliezer Damascus? And Abraham, and Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Now, Eliezer is not mentioned anywhere else by name, but the context would indicate he was probably the senior most trusted servant in Abraham's household. In that culture, in that time, if Abraham were to die without a son, his eldest servant would become his heir. And it's also worth mentioning, this is the first time it is recorded that Abraham actually spoke to God. Um, as mentioned earlier, Abraham is not young. And he's considerable, his considerable time has passed since God had promised Abraham heirs. Abraham's question really highlights the root of his faith challenge. God seemingly slow in fulfilling his promise. Verse 4 and 5 says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. The Lord does a wonderful thing here. He doesn't get angry with Abraham. He doesn't chastise him. Instead, God recognizes Abraham's anxiety and he extends to him patience and assurance. God tells him, no, Abraham, I will give you your very own son. God then brings Abraham outside and he shows him the wonders of the stars in the heaven and a reminder of God's majesty. 
And he tells Abraham, count them if you can. And this is how it will be with your descendants, Abraham, more than you can count. Abraham has just come to another fork in the road. On the one hand, experience and observation in the ways of the world tells him he's too old. Sarah is too. It's been a long time, Abraham's thinking. Maybe there's something I'm supposed to do. On the other hand, God has made it clear. Abraham's offspring will come from his own body. He will have a son. Furthermore, God reaffirms to Abraham his original promise. A great nation will come from him. Does he believe God or not? Abraham chose to believe God. To me, the next verse is probably the most amazing verse in the book of Genesis. It's always why I like to call it the the gospel of Genesis, really. Verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. He believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Though Abraham had demonstrated his faith with action... For the most part, it wasn't his works that made him righteous before God. It was his faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. We, too, are made righteous before God by faith. Salvation by faith is not a New Testament concept. God has been saying this from the very beginning. This is Genesis. We have always had a need to be made righteous before the Lord in order to be saved. But the righteousness necessary has never come from good works on our behalf. It's only through faith, belief, trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross that we are made righteous before an almighty God. Do we believe God? Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 25 says, No distrust made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Abraham wasn't perfect. And for those familiar with his story, you know that twice he tried to pass his wife Sarah off as his sister, once while he was in Egypt in chapter 13, and later at the city of Gerar with King Abimelech in chapter 20. We also know from chapter 16, Abraham had a child with Hagar, one of Sarah's servants, trying to accomplish God's promises in his own strength. Yet God saw Abraham as righteous because of his faith. The enemy would whisper in our ears, and he would tell us, we're not good enough. You're not good enough. Our faith isn't strong enough. Look, we blew it. Abraham blew it. But we need to remember that isn't how God saw Abraham, and it isn't how he sees you. Like Abraham, God is taking each of us on a faith journey. Our faith grows as we continue to walk with the Lord and learn to trust Him. We don't start as spiritual giants, and God doesn't expect that. The Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the Philippians, in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 16, he says, Now that I have already obtained, not, excuse me, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, 
But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. See, even Paul knew he hadn't arrived yet. Going back to Genesis 15, verse 7 and 8, it says, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? God reminds Abraham who he is and what he's doing for him. And then Abraham asks God, well, how am I to know that I shall possess it? By questioning God, is Abraham's faith waffling a little? Probably, yeah. No doubt mine would. But before we're too quick to criticize Abraham, isn't that exactly how most of us would respond? Abraham needs a little confirmation and assurance right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. Today we have the Bible to guide us, right? We, we can find our assurances in God's Word. We have the Holy Spirit to prompt us, encourage us, and guide us. Abraham didn't have the Bible to guide him. He was living purely by God's uh, communication. And often there was a substantial period of time in between those conversations. Long periods of silence. But all of this was to grow Abraham's faith and teach him to trust God. Isn't that exactly what he does with us? And I love this next part, verse 9 through 11. He said to him, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid them each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. What I love about this is God again responds to Abraham's apprehensions, his need for assurance. And God does that by meeting him where he is and giving him what he needs. There has been much to do made over the significance of the ritual enacted between Abraham and God. But I think the more important point here is, is that this was a very common cultural practice in Abraham's day, making contracts and treaties this way. In fact, writings from the time refer to covenants or treaties as being cut in reference to this ritual. Abraham obviously needed a sign, some kind of reassurance that God was still in it with him, that God was still going to fulfill his promises. So God entered into a covenant. He confirmed through a ceremony that Abraham was familiar with to shore him up and to put him at ease. God gave Abraham what he needed. Verse 12 through 16 says, And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Abraham had done what the Lord had commanded. And after spending the day shooing away birds from the carcasses of the animals, the sun began to set and Abraham grew sleepy. And after falling into this deep sleep, he experiences what is described as a dreadful and great darkness. The Lord prophesied to Abraham about a time in the future of his descendants. The Lord tells him about a time when his descendants will live in Egypt. 
and they're going to be slaves and horribly treated by the Egyptians. But in the fourth generation, they will be rescued from the Egyptians. God's talking about when Moses led them out of Egypt in the book of Exodus. God also let Abraham know he would judge them for the way they treated the Israelites. God did judge the Egyptians for their mistreatment of the Israelites and their refusal to let his people go. The Lord visited 10 plagues on the Egyptians. The last and final plague was accomplished at Passover when the Lord commanded the Israelites to cover the doorposts of their homes with the blood of an unblemished lamb, paint the door frames of their homes. And on that night, the Lord sent a destroying angel to deliver his final judgment upon Egypt. The destroying angel struck down the firstborn male of both man and beast throughout all Egypt, including the Pharaoh's own son. When the Pharaoh had finally been broken and relented, the Israelites would come out of Egypt and they would take with them great possessions. We're told in Exodus chapter 11, verse 35 and 36, the Israelites took with them much silver and gold, clothing and plunder from the Egyptians. But the Lord would still have to deal with the Amorites, and the Israelites would not take possession of the promised land until the sins of the Amorites had been complete. It's interesting here to observe God prepares the Israelites to take possession of the land based on his foreknowledge of the Amorites. The Lord knows the Amorites will sin grievously, enough that his judgment on them is certain, and the Lord has planned accordingly. Amorite was a title that uh, was synonymous with Canaanite. It um, may have been a confederation of different tribes in the land of Canaan. These were the people who occupied the promised land at the time of Abraham. What was the iniquity or gross wickedness of the Amorites? We aren't told specifically, but we do know uh, from archaeology that they engaged in idolatry, ritual prostitution, and child sacrifice. I think there's two things we should observe here. First, Abraham would not see the complete fulfillment of the promised land. Hebrews 11.13 tells us these, including Abraham, all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Second, God would not bring Abraham's descendants into the land until the fullness of the Amorites' sin was complete. Even though God foreknew their sin, he withheld judgment until their sin was complete. In his mercy, God allowed the Amorites time to repent. At just the right time, the Lord would act. He's long-suffering and he's patient, but there comes a time his justice requires action. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Verse 17 through 21, it says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. <laughs> the Lord assures Abraham that his descendants will inherit the land. God represents himself as a smoking pot and a flaming torch in this, vis in this vision. And that's reminiscent of the pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night he used with Abraham's descendants when Moses led them from Egypt. 
The Lord had promised it, and now he was pleased to ratify it in the form of a covenant Abraham was familiar with. The Lord gave Abraham a remarkable sign and a promise to both him and his descendants. Why did God give this strange vision to Abraham? Well, it represents an incredible promise from God, but it also represents a huge responsibility for Abraham. I believe, once again, Abraham came to a fork in the road. The Lord had said it. The Lord even entered into a ritual covenant with Abraham. Will Abraham choose to believe or not? Will he trust in the Lord or not? In Abraham's case, once again, we have our answer in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. And I read again. These all, including Abraham, died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The Lord went on to define the borders of the land he had given to Abraham's descendants. He gave them the land from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River. Today, that would be from the outskirts of Cairo, Egypt, all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to Baghdad, Iraq. To date, Israel has never completely occupied the land the Lord gave him. The modern state of Israel is, is um, only, it only occupies a fraction of the land that God gave them. In conclusion, I want us to observe three things here. Three things about Abraham's walk with the Lord. And really, this has to do with the way the Lord works in the lives of all his children, one way or another. First, like Abraham, God calls us to follow, to follow him. The Lord told Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land I will show you. We come to our first fork in the road when we are confronted with the choice to follow him and leave behind our old familiar ways and things. For the first 30 years of my life, I returned to that fork in the road countless times before I chose like Abraham. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Lord calls us to deny ourselves. Stop trying to do things on our own and in our own way. Instead, to take up our cross. In other words, stop chasing this world and accept a relationship with him, following him, living a life of love and sacrifice like him. Next, God tests us. From time to time, God brings us to points of crisis. Abraham was faced with many trials and tests of faith. Sometimes he did well. Other times, not so much. Like Abraham, we too are presented with trials. God uses these trials or tests to challenge our faith and grow us. These are our forks in the road, forks in the road for us too. Will we trust the Lord or not? James chapter 1, verses 2, 2 and 4 tells us, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. These trials are necessary in order to grow us and mature us in our faith and relationship with Him. Failure doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. That's a lie straight from the mouth of Satan. All it means is there's growing work to be done. There's growing work to be done. Part of the reason for testing is the Lord is identifying those areas in us that do need work. 
You know, the great thing about the Lord's test is, right? You know the great thing is? <laughs> when you fail, he's perfectly willing to let you take it over again. <laughs> and over again. <laughs> and last, God works through us. Abraham ultimately became the father of the Jewish people, the very people whom God used to bring us the Savior of the world. God accomplished a mighty work through Abraham. Was Abraham perfect? Absolutely not. He didn't need to be because he served a God who is perfect, perfect in every way. Like Abraham, God is shaping us to use us, that he might do his mighty work through us as he continues to shape us and mold us into useful vessels. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Lord, your word, Lord. Um, we thank you, Lord, for your countless, your countless um, opportunities for us to grow. Lord, we're so thankful that you don't give up on us. We're so thankful, Lord, that um, with each test uh, comes new growth, Lord. With, with each challenge comes new growth. And you're so patient and you're so loving. We just love you and we're so grateful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.